everybody. Hello. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. In this video, we're going to be tracing the history of one of gaming's most interesting franchises, Oddworld. Though most players are probably familiar with Abe, the titular character of the franchise's first two games, Oddworld as a concept and idea was originally conceived to be much more expansive and encompass more than just the adventures of one particular character. In fact, Oddworld was planned to be a blank canvas where different games could be set in totally different regions with different characters, yet still be tied together and interlinked. Oddworld is very much the creation of Lorne Lanning, who founded game studio Oddworld Inhabitants in 1994 with Sherry McKenna. The two of them had come from the world of movie special effects, and Lanning saw an immense potential in the gaming space to make narrative-driven games with richly textured environments and cinematic storylines. Lanning was deeply inspired by creators like George Lucas, who didn't just make films, but crafted entire worlds for stories to take place in. He was also inspired by the way that other mediums, like movies, had the potential to pose important ethical and philosophical questions to audiences. It was a style that Lanning wanted to emulate in the medium of gaming. Originally, a quintology of five Oddworld games were envisioned, though over the past few decades, only two entries to that quintology have actually been released. In this video, we're going to take a look back at those two games and the plethora of spin-offs and reboots that make up the Oddworld franchise. After you're done, I'd love to hear your thoughts on what the best Oddworld game is and what you'd like to see from the Oddworld series in the future. Let me know in the comments and, without further ado, let's get going. Our first stop is the 1990s. The first Oddworld game was Abe's Odyssey, released for the PlayStation in 1997, and it immediately succeeded in bringing Lanning's Oddworld vision to life. The game set the tone right away, with a phenomenal CGI cutscene that gave us a background on the plucky hero Abe, a strange alien creature called a Madokan. We also learn about the world he exists in. It's a dark, gritty, industrial hellhole of a world, in which Abe and his fellow Madokans are slaves, working in a factory, rupture farms, that turns them and many other animals of Oddworld into tasty snacks. The factory is incredibly oppressive and is patrolled by Sligs, who act as its violent security force. And it's up to Abe, who's presented as an unlikely and charming protagonist, to escape and save as many Madokans as possible in the process. The opening sets out the premise of the game, it's an adventure that highlights the dangers of industrialization and the inequalities that exist in society. But at the same time, due to the comical nature of the game's characters and enemies, there's still a sense of humor to be enjoyed that helps to break up the grim themes of the game. The gameplay of Abe's Odyssey was a bit of a throwback to the puzzle platformer games of times past, games like Prince of Persia. It was a game that put a premium on patience. Navigating every screen while avoiding being killed by enemies and obstacles, and solving environmental puzzles to help save the Madokans was what Odyssey was all about. To do that, the player had to use all of Abe's abilities, his role, his game speak where he can communicate with other Madokans, and his jumping. Though as Abe can be killed in one hit by enemies and mines and other obstacles, the player has to be extremely careful when progressing. Abe also had the unique ability to be able to possess enemies with a chant and take control of them, which added another layer of fun to the game. Abe's Odyssey was a 2D game, released in a year where 3D games were all the rage, but Odyssey made the most of its 2D nature. The pre-rendered backgrounds were brimming with realistic detail that made Odyssey stand out compared to a lot of its more colourful or its three-dimensional competition. The brilliant juxtaposition of the grey, dingy atmosphere of Rupture Farms and the appealing and cartoony look of the Madokans and even the Sligs was a tantalising contrast that somehow worked. The unique mixture of tight, precise controls, punishing difficulty, awesome cinematics, excellent level design and interesting character design made this a game that was satisfying to play and a treat for the senses. To say that Abe's Odyssey was a success would be a gigantic understatement. It did so well 
that it launched Abe to superstardom and he took his place alongside Crash Bandicoot, Lara Croft and Sparrow the Dragon as something of a mascot for the PlayStation. A mascot that appealed to old and young alike. A sequel was ultimately inevitable. Before that, let's talk localization issues. Abe's Odyssey was released over in Japan as Abe Gogo, and due to some cultural differences, it included some alterations that would go on to be canonized in later Oddworld titles. One noticeable change is the design of the Madokan Pops, made less morbid in Japan due to some contemporaneous murders that had recently shocked the nation. This change would be present in subsequent Oddworld games in all regions. Another significant change came when the developers of Oddworld discovered Japan's distaste for four-fingered characters. This is due to an old cultural phenomenon where meatpackers were considered the bottom rung of feudal Japanese society. Four fingers came to be associated with this subclass due to the frequency of accidents, i.e. accidentally cutting off one's own finger. Abe and the Madokans were altered to have just three fingers per hand for Japanese audiences, but this change was later incorporated globally going forward. It's safe to say that Abe's Odyssey was a runaway success, so much so that publishers GT Interactive eyed up the prospect of a quick follow-up game released just in time for Christmas 1998. They got their wish with the release of Abe's Exodus, released just a year after the original game after a tight nine-month dev cycle. As a relatively quick follow-up, made at the behest of the publishers, Exodus was considered a bonus side game and not part of that original Oddworld Quintology. In Abe's Exodus, which takes place immediately after Abe's Odyssey, Abe is sent on a quest by his deceased ancestors to destroy the mega factories that produce Soulstorm Brew, a product made from a number of secret ingredients, including the bones of dead Madokans. On this quest, Abe also had the chance to rescue a grand total of 300 Madokans, some addicted to Soulstorm Brew and others with their eyes sewn shut so as to not recognize the bones they're harvesting. It's a grim premise, and Exodus stayed true to the heart of the first game, with plenty of disturbing and emotional imagery. It's got themes of soulless exploitation, while at the same time retaining that signature sense of humor. In terms of gameplay, Exodus was largely identical to Odyssey, so there isn't a huge amount to say about it that hasn't already been said. There were a few noticeable additions though. Abe could now possess more creatures than just slugs. He could possess scrabs, paramites, gluckens, and even his own farts. More possessions led to more variety and more funny scenarios. The game also included some important quality of life changes, like Abe being able to call and order around multiple Madokans at once, and the inclusion of the much needed feature of being able to save the game at any point. Ultimately, Odyssey had such tight gameplay that Exodus wasn't really required to reinvent the wheel. More of the same meant more of the good stuff, and despite its short development time, Exodus was a lot longer than its predecessor, and ultimately a very worthy and enjoyable successor to Odyssey that is arguably better than that original game. Interestingly, Oddworld Inhabitants submitted a 15-minute slightly altered compilation of Exodus's cutscenes for the Best Animated Short Films category of the Academy Awards. The film failed to meet the shortlist, but it nevertheless made history as the first video game movie to even broach the Academy Awards, and it's testament to the excellent cinematics of the game and the faith that Oddworld Inhabitants had in their own storytelling abilities. Also released in 1998 was Oddworld Adventures, a portable, slimmed-down version of Abe's Odyssey released for the Game Boy. The Abe games were fairly simple, so they had the potential to translate quite well onto a handheld system. That potential wasn't really realized. A lot of the charm of Abe's Odyssey was lost in translation, as the Game Boy version lacked the music, beautiful backgrounds and cutscenes that made the first game so ambient and full of character. Worse still, there were no other Madokans in sight, and the entire game took place outside of Rupture Farms, so the game also lacked the narrative and thematic punch of the original. This game is worth a look for collectors, but can safely be ignored by everybody else. A handheld port of Abe's Exodus would predictably follow, 
Released for the Game Boy Color, we have Oddworld Adventures 2, and it's a significantly better experience than its predecessor. The addition of a splash of color helped to add a lot more personality to the game, particularly in the background department. Plus, it had a threadbare story, along with the familiar presence of fellow Madokans, making it a slightly more faithful handheld reimagining. The capabilities of the Game Boy Color still hampered it though, as it doesn't begin to approach how awesome the PlayStation title was. Though it's a much more valiant attempt to port that signature Oddworld gameplay onto a handheld console. That brings us swiftly on to the second game in the Oddworld quintology, Munch's Odyssey. It was released in 2001 exclusively for the Xbox, a controversial move considering Abe's status as a PlayStation icon. But being a game that made extensive use of cinematics, the Xbox was cited as the only system powerful enough to realise the vision of the game. Munch's Odyssey was a first in many different ways for the Oddworld series. It was the first game not to star Abe as the game's sole protagonist, it was the first 3D Oddworld game, and it was the first game in the main series not to receive a PlayStation release. Munch's Odyssey takes place a while after Abe's exodus and sees Abe helping Munch, the last of a race of amphibian creatures called gabbits, whose eggs, a delicacy, had been overfished, causing their near extinction. Abe and Munch join forces, with Abe agreeing to help Munch rescue the last known can of gabbiar made of gabbit eggs, and Munch agreeing to help Abe rescue more captured Madokans. All of those classic Oddworld themes of industrialization and consumerism all made a depressingly dark return once again. The story had a few very emotional moments, particularly the scene where Munch realizes he's the last of the Gabbits. The jump to 3D resulted in the game playing quite differently from the previous titles. Abe and Munch got to explore more wide open 3D spaces. There were still lots of environmental puzzles to be solved, but much less emphasis was placed on strategy and on trial and error, especially when encountering enemies. One kill deaths were gone in favour of a health system, and all of the characters possessed the ability to fight back, so it was possible to solve problems and progress using a wider variety of tactics and approaches. Abe and Munch had complementary abilities, and the game required swapping between the two to overcome different challenges. Munch had the ability to swim, operate machinery and zap enemies, while Abe had decent jumping, the power of possession, and the ability to pick up and throw things. The gameplay and graphics have both, in my opinion, aged quite gracefully, though the atmosphere of the game does feel emptier than the 2D titles, as the 3D environments aren't packed with as much detail as the beautiful backgrounds of the PS1 games. A lot of the areas are quite similar as well, resulting in Munch's Odyssey feeling a lot less memorable than its predecessors. Lanning and the team have since described Munch's Odyssey as their biggest disappointment, citing that the team struggled to adapt the 2D gameplay to the 3D world. Munch's Odyssey wasn't a bad game by any stretch of the imagination, but it was prepping to be one of the Xbox's big hitters. Ultimately, it was completely eclipsed by another Xbox launch title, Halo, and it didn't make the impact many felt it should have. As with the two PlayStation titles, Munch's Odyssey also received a handheld port in 2003 on the Game Boy Advance. Unlike its console counterpart, the handheld version of Munch's Odyssey received generally unfavourable reviews upon release. The GBA was capable of rendering a half-decent Oddworld atmosphere, but the bird's eye view of the game, obviously trying to emulate the wide-open 3D spaces of the Xbox version, were pretty underwhelming. Not much to see here. Next we have Stranger's Wrath, another spin-off game and not part of the Oddworld Quintology. If Munch's Odyssey represented a creative and interesting step for the Oddworld series into the realm of 3D, then Stranger's Wrath represented a gigantic leap into totally uncharted waters. Released for the Xbox in 2005, Stranger's Wrath did away with the puzzle-based gaming altogether that the Oddworld series was known for. It also did away with Abe entirely. In this game, the player controlled Stranger, a gunslinging cowboy character in a wild western setting. Story-wise, Stranger is a bounty hunter, catching bounties to pay for a mysterious operation. Abe might be missing, but Stranger's Wrath 
has that heady mixture of humour, social commentary and sentimentality that Odyssey, Exodus and Muncher's Odyssey all had. It was an Oddworld game through and through. Perhaps more dramatic than the change of setting is the change of gameplay. The game seamlessly combined multiple playstyles, crossing first-person shooting sections with third-person platforming and combat sections. This was a pretty big departure from the previous games, but it was executed with such grace that it worked very well. Travelling and exploring from a third-person perspective felt fluid and great, while the shooting felt totally unique. Stranger had only a single weapon, a crossbow, but it could be loaded with lots of different live ammo types with different abilities. It's brilliantly creative and funny. Add role-playing elements to the mix in the form of weapon and item upgrades, and you've got yourself an incredibly well-done action-adventure game. Stranger's Wrath was received very well by critics, but it suffered from disappointing sales figures, with the game selling significantly less than was required for the project to break even. Exactly why Stranger's Wrath did poorly, considering it received universal praise, is a topic for discussion. Fans have placed the blame on publisher EA, suggesting they tried to sabotage the game by offering Stranger's Wrath a tiny advertising and marketing budget. Lanning has suggested EA might well have been unhappy, committing to advertising an Xbox exclusive game. Either way, it's a real shame because Stranger's Wrath is a real diamond in the rough. Now, before I go on, and talk about the more modern additions to the Oddworld franchise, I need to address one elephant in the room. Oddworld is kind of weird because there's a graveyard of relatively well-documented, cancelled and unreleased Oddworld games out there. For example, sequels to both Munch's Odyssey and Stranger's Wrath have been mentioned at one time or another, but I'd like to run through two specific cancelled games that we have a little bit more information on. Hand of Odd, planned for the PlayStation 2, stands out as the most interesting cancelled game. It was going to be a real-time strategy game that was originally worked on prior to 2004. Players would take control of either the tree huggers or the land muggers and build their respective village or industrial centre. It seems to me like the sort of game that suits the odd world atmosphere perfectly. Though the game was dropped partially out of a fear that real-time strategy games were declining in popularity at the time. The second cancelled game worth mentioning is The Brutal Ballad of Fangus Clot. A decidedly more gritty and visceral sounding game, Fangus Clot was going to star a buff, rabies-infected humanoid hero in a more politically intense and dark interpretation of Oddworld. Details of Fangus Clot were first released in the April 2005 issue of Game Informer magazine leading to an assumption that Fangus Clot was an elaborate April Fool's joke. In reality, it wasn't, but it was scrapped shortly after the article, partially because it was an original Xbox game planned for release after the Xbox 360, which would have made it somewhat outdated upon release. One final scrapped idea that's worth mentioning is that Abe was originally planned to be added as a downloadable character in 2012's crossover fighting game PlayStation All-Stars Battle Royale, though due to that game's poor financial performance, any DLC, including Abe, was unfortunately abandoned. Oddworld Inhabitants, it seems, struggled after the lacklustre release of Stranger's Wrath, and any Oddworld plans or ideas were put on hold while Lanning and McKenna explored other multimedia franchise ideas which, for one reason or another, didn't pan out. It seems that the rise of digital distribution led to Lanning getting back on the horse and returning to Oddworld. When Odyssey and Exodus hit digital storefronts like Steam and enjoyed positive fan feedback, Lanning saw the potential to return to the series 2D roots and make another game centred around Abe. That game turned out to be Oddworld New and Tasty, an HD reimagining of Abe's Odyssey developed by Just Add Water a UK-based studio who had previously handled the HD remasters of Munch's Odyssey and Stranger's Wrath. New and Tasty released in 2014, nearly a decade after the last original Oddworld game, and fans were ready for another instalment. New and Tasty deviated away from Odyssey's style in a number of noticeable ways though. Most prominently, rather than the screen-by-screen -screen style of the original, 
new and tasty functioned as more of a wide open side scroller, which combined with the less restrictive controls and some of the added enemies and obstacles, made new and tasty a faster, more fluid and more action packed interpretation of that classic Oddworld style. New and Tasty's revamped visuals also brought Oddworld to life in a brighter and more vibrant way than ever before. It was a real treat for the eyes. Overall, people loved New and Tasty, but some very valid criticisms can be levelled at the game. There's no doubt that the spirit of New and Tasty is definitely different than the original. The vibrant colour schemes clash with the dim visuals of the original, and one particularly bad addition is the in-game ads that appear in Rupture Farms, advertising real-world video games. It was a very immersion-breaking addition, especially ironic because of Oddworld's staunchly anti-capitalist messages. If you want a longer, more nuanced critique of the game, I'd recommend checking out Matthew Matosis's video on the topic. The question is, is New and Tasty better than the original? Well, I'd argue it's a totally different game in many ways, and I enjoy both. Personally, I like the fact that New and Tasty isn't just a remaster, but a complete remake from the ground up that has its own ideas. It's a totally different experience than the original, for better or for worse. New and Tasty was a phenomenal financial success, so naturally, Abe's Exodus is next in line to receive a modern reimagining as Oddworld Soulstorm, due to be released April 2021. Oddworld Inhabitants' partnership with Just Add Water has drawn to a close, but Soulstorm looks to be a more action-packed interpretation of Exodus in the same spirit as New and Tasty. Considering Exodus was made under extremely taxing conditions, it'll be interesting to see what alterations are made to the game now that it's had years of development time under its belt. And with that, our history draws to a close. What is next for Oddworld after Soulstorm? I'd like to see Lanning & Co return to the Oddworld Quintology idea, and take players on a new, creative journey exploring a part of Oddworld we've never seen before. The history of Oddworld is sure to continue in one form or another, and I'm sure there'll be some odd turns here and there. Thanks for watching everybody! As I mentioned at the start, I'd love to know which is your favourite Oddworld game, and what you'd like to see from the series in the future. If you enjoyed this video, consider giving it a like and subscribing for more video game stuff in the future. Thanks, and see you next time.